द महाभारत ऑफ कृष्ण अद्वैपयनाव्यासा Translated into English prose from the original Sanskrit text by Pratap Chandra Roy CIE. This free ebook has been downloaded from holybooks.com. Vana Purva. Section 253 Dhosha Yatra Purva continued. Vesampayana continued, O king, O lord of men, that slayer of hostile heroes, Dasutha's son said these words to Duryodhana O Kaurava Duryodhana do thou lay unto thy heart the words that I shall tell thee and O repressor of force after having heard my words it behoveth thee to act accordingly every way now O best of monarchs O hero hath the earth been rid of force do thou rule her even like the mighty minded Sakra himself having his force destroyed Vesampayana continued having been thus addressed by karna the king again spake unto him saying o bull among men nothing whatever is unattainable to him who hath thee for refuge and to whom thou art attached and on whose welfare thou art entirely intent now i have a purpose which do thou truly listen to having beheld that foremost of sacrifices the mighty rajasuya performed by the pandavas a desire heart sprung up in me to celebrate the same do thou o sutha's son fulfill this desire of mine thus addressed karna spake thus unto the king now that all the rulers of the earth have been brought under thy subjection do thou summon the principal brahmanas and o best of gurus duly procure the articles required for the sacrifice and o repressor of force let it which as as prescribed and versed in the waves celebrate thy rites according to the ordinance o king and o bull of the bharata race let thy great sacrifice also abounding in meats and drinks and grand with parts commence o king having been thus addressed by karna dhritarashtra son summoned the priest and spake unto him these words Do thou duly and in proper order celebrate for me that best of sacrifices the rajasuya furnished with excellent dakshinas thus it costed that best of brahmanas spake unto the king saying o foremost of the kauravas while yudhishthira is living that best of sacrifices cannot be performed in thy family o prince of kings further o monarch thy father dhritarashtra endured with long life liveth for this reason also o best of kings this sacrifice cannot be undertaken by thee there is o lord another great sacrifice resembling the rajasuya do thou o foremost of kings celebrate that sacrifice listen to these words of mine all these rulers of the earth who have o king become tributary to thee will pay the tribute in gold both pure and impure of that gold do thou o best of monarchs now make the sacrificial plow and do thou o bharata plow the sacrificial compound with it at that spot let there commence o foremost of kings with due rites and without any disturbance the sacrifice sanctified with mantras abounding in edibles the name of that sacrifice worthy of virtuous persons is vishnava no person save the ancient vishnu hath performed it before this mighty sacrifice wise with that best of sacrifices the rajasuya itself and further it like it ascend it is also for thy welfare to celebrate it and moreover it is capable of being celebrated without any disturbance by undertaking this thy desire will be fulfilled Having been thus addressed by those brahmanas dhritarashtra's son the king spake these words to karna his brothers and the son of suvila beyond doubt the words of the brahmanas are entirely liked by me if they are relished by you also express it without delay thus appealed they all said unto the king so be it then the king one by one appointed persons to their respective tasks and desired all the artisans to construct the sacrificial plow and 
O best of kings, all that had been commanded to be done, was gradually executed. Thus ends the 253rd section in the Ghoshaya Trapava of the Vana Pava. Section 254, Ghoshaya Trapava continued. Vesampayana continued, then all the artisans, the principal counsellors, and the highly wise Vidura said unto Dhritarshtra's son, All the preparations for the excellent sacrifice have been made, O king, and the time also hath come, O Bharata. And the exceedingly precious golden plough hath been constructed. Hearing this, O monarch, that best of kings, Dhritarshtra's son commanded that prime among sacrifices to be commenced. Then commenced that sacrifice sanctified by mantras, and abounding in edibles, and the son of Gandhari was duly initiated according to the ordinance. And Dhritarshtra, and the illustrious Vidura, and Bhishma, and Drona, and Kripa, and Karna, and the celebrated Gandhari experienced great delight. And, O foremost of kings, Duryodhana dispatched swift messengers to invite the princes and the Brahmanas. And mounting fleet vehicles they went to the respective directions assigned to them. Then to a certain messenger on the point of setting out, Dusasana said, Go thou speedily to the woods of Dvaita, and in that forest duly invite the Brahmanas and those wicked persons, the Pandavas. Thereupon, he repaired thither, and bowing down to all the Pandavas, said, having acquired immense wealth by his native prowess, that best of kings and foremost of gurus, Duryodhana, O monarch, is celebrating a sacrifice. Thither are going from various directions the kings and the Brahmanas. O king, I have been sent by the high souled Kaurava. That king and lord of men, Dhritarshtra's son, invites you. It behoveth you therefore to witness the delightful sacrifice of that monarch. Hearing these words of the messenger, that tiger among kings, the royal Yudhishthira said, By good luck it is that that enhancer of the glory of his ancestors, King Suyodhana is celebrating this best of sacrifices. We should certainly repair thither, but we cannot do now, for till the completion of the thirteenth year we shall have to observe our vow. Hearing this speech of Yudhishthira the just, Bhima said these words, Then will King Yudhishthira the just go thither, when he will cast him Duryodhana into the fire kindled by weapons. Do thou say unto Suyodhana, when after the expiration of the thirteenth year that lord of men, the Pandava, will in the sacrifice of battle, pour upon the Dhritarshtras, the clarified butter of his ear, then will I come. But the other Pandavas, O king, did not say anything unpleasant. The messenger on his return related unto Dhritarshtra's son all, as it had fallen out. Then there came to the city of Dhritarshtra many foremost of men, lords of various countries, and highly virtuous Brahmanas. And duly received in order according to the ordinance, those lords of men experienced great delight and were all well pleased. And that foremost among monarchs Dhritarshtra surrounded by all the Kauravas, experienced the height of joy and spake unto Vidura saying, Do thou, O Kshatta, speedily so act that all persons in the sacrificial compound may be served with food, be refreshed and satisfied. Thereupon, O repressor of force, assenting to that order the learned Vidura, versed in morality, cheerfully entertained all the orders in proper measure with meat and beverages to eat and drink and fragrant garland and various kinds of attire. And having constructed pavilions for their accommodation, that hero and foremost of kings, duly entertained the princes and the brahmanas by thousands, and also bestowing upon them wealth of various kinds, bade them farewell. And having dismissed all the kings, he entered Hastinapura, surrounded by his brothers, and in company with Karna and Suvila's son. Thus ends the 254th section in the Ghoshaya Trapava of the Vana Pava. Section 255, Ghoshaya Trapava continued. Vesampayana said, While, O great king, Duryodhana was entering the city, 
the panegyrists eulogized the prince of unfailing prowess and others also eulogized that mighty bowman and foremost of kings and sprinkling over him fried paddy and sandal paste the citizens said by good luck it is o king that thy sacrifice hath been completed without obstruction and some more reckless of speech that were present there said unto that lord of the earth surely this thy sacrifice cannot be compared with yudhishthira's nor doth this come up to a sixteenth part of that sacrifice thus spake unto that king some that were reckless of consequences his friends however said this sacrifice of thine heart surpassed all others yayati and nahusha and mandata and bharata having been sanctified by celebrating such a sacrifice have all gone to heaven hearing such agreeable words from his friends that monarch o bull of the bharata's race well pleased entered the city and finally his own abode then o king worshiping the feet of his father and mother and of others headed by bhishma drona and kripa and of the wise vidura and worshiped in turn by his younger brothers that delight of brothers sat down upon an excellent seat surrounded by the latter and the sutra's son rising up said by good luck it is o foremost of the bharata race that this mighty sacrifice of thine heart been brought to a close when however the sons of prita shall have been slain in battle and thou wilt have completed the rajasuya sacrifice once again o lord of men shall i honor thee thus then that mighty king the illustrious son of dhritarashtra replied unto him truly hath this been spoken by thee when o foremost of men the wicked minded pandavas have been slain and when also the grand rajasuya hath been celebrated by me then thou shalt again o hero honor me thus and having said this o bharata the korava embraced karna and began o mighty king to think of the rajasuya that foremost of sacrifices and that best of kings also addressed the gurus around him saying when shall i ye koravas having slain all the pandavas celebrate that costly and foremost of sacrifices the rajasuya then spake karna unto him saying hear me elephant among kings so long as i do not slay arjuna i shall not allow any one to wash my feet nor shall i taste meat and i shall observe the asura vow and whoever may solicit me for anything i never shall say i have it not when karna had thus vowed to slay falguna in battle those mighty charioteers and bowmen the sons of dhritarashtra sent up a loud cheer and dhritarashtra's sons thought that the pandavas had already been conquered then that chief of kings the graceful duryodhana leaving those bulls among men entered his apartment like the lord kuvara entering the garden of chitrarata and all those mighty bowmen also o bharata went to their respective quarters meanwhile those mighty bowmen the pandavas excited by the words the messenger had spoken became anxious and they did not from that time experience the least happiness intelligence further o foremost of kings had been brought by spies regarding the vow of the sutra's son to slay vijaya hearing this o lord of men dharma's son became exceedingly anxious and considering karna of the impenetrable mail to be of wonderful prowess and remembering all their woes he knew no peace and that high souled one filled with anxiety made up his mind to abandon the woods about dwaitavana abounding with ferocious animals meanwhile the royal son of dhritarashtra began to rule the earth along with his heroic brothers as also with bhishma and drona and kripa and with the assistance of the sutra's son crowned with martial glory duryodhana remained ever intent on the welfare of the rulers of the earth and he worshiped the foremost of brahmanas by celebrating sacrifices with profuse gifts and that hero and subduer of force o king was engaged in doing good to his brothers 
concluding for certain in his mind that giving and enjoying are the only use of riches. Thus ends the 255th section in the Dhoshayatra Purva of the Vana Purva. Section 256, Dhoshayatra Purva continued. Janamejaya said, after having delivered Duryodhana, what did the mighty sons of Pandu do in that forest? It behoveth thee to tell me this. Vesampayana said, once on a time, as Yudhishthira lay down at night in the Dvaita woods, some deer with accents choked in tears, presented themselves before him in his dreams. To them standing with joined hands, their bodies trembling all over, that foremost of monarchs said, Tell me what ye wish to say. Who are ye? And what do ye desire? Thus accosted by Kunti's son the illustrious Pandava, those dear, the remnant of those that had been slaughtered, replied unto him, saying, we are, Bharata, those deer that are still alive after them that had been slaughtered. We shall be exterminated totally. Therefore, do thou change thy residence. O mighty king, all thy brothers are heroes conversant with weapons, they have thinned the ranks of the rangers of the forest. We few the remnants, mighty minded one, remain like seed. By thy favor, O king of kings, let us increase. Seeing these deer, which remained like seed after the rest had been destroyed trembling and afflicted with fear, Yudhisht Bhairada just was greatly affected with grief. And the king, intent on the welfare of all creatures, said unto them, So be it. I shall act as ye have said. Awaking after such a vision, that excellent king, moved by pity towards the deer, Thus spake unto his brothers assembled there, those deer that are alive after them that have been slaughtered, accosted me of night, after I had awakened, saying, We remain like the cues of our lines. Blessed be thou. Do thou have compassion on us. And they have spoken truly. We ought to feel pity for the dwellers of the forest. We have been feeding on them for a year together and eight months. Let us therefore again repair to the romantic Kamyakas, that best of forests abounding in wild animals, situated at the head of the desert, near Lake Trinavindu. And there let us pleasantly pass the rest of our time. Then, O King, the Pandavas worst in morality, swiftly departed thence, accompanied by the Brahmana and all those that lived with them, and followed by Indrasena and other retainers and proceeding along the roads walked by travellers, furnished with excellent corn and clear water, they at length beheld the sacred asylum of Kamyaka endued with ascetic merit. And as pious men entered the celestial regions, those foremost of the Bharata race, the Pandavas, surrounded by those bulls among Brahmanas entered that forest. Thus ends the 256th section in the Ghoshayatra Purva of the Vana Purva. Section 257, Dhoshayatra Purva continued. Vesampayana continued, dwelling in the woods, O bull of the Bharata race, the high-souled Pandavas spent one and ten years in a miserable plight. And although deserving of happiness those foremost of men, brooding over their circumstances passed their days miserably, living on fruits and roots. And that royal sage, the mighty armed Yudhishthira, reflecting that the extremity of misery that had befallen his brothers was owing to his own fault, and remembering those sufferings that had arisen from his act of gambling, could not sleep peacefully. And he felt as if his heart had been pierced with a lance. And remembering the harsh words of the Sutta's son, the Pandava, repressing the venom of his wrath passed his time in humble guise, sighing heavily. And Arjuna and both the twins and the illustrious Draupadi, and the mighty Bhima, he that was strongest of all men, experienced the most poignant pain in casting their eyes on Yudhishthira. And thinking that a short time only remained of their exile, those bulls among men influenced by rage and hope and by resorting to various exertions and endeavors, made their bodies assume almost different shapes. 
After a little while that mighty ascetic, Vyasa the son of Satyavati, came there to see the Pandavas. And seeing him approach, Kunti's son, Yudhishthira, stepped forward and duly received that high-souled one. And having gratified Vyasa by bowing down unto him, Pandu's son of subdued senses, after the Rishi had been seated, sat down before him desirous of listening to him. And beholding his grandsons lean and living in the forest on the produce of the wilderness, that mighty sage, moved by compassion, said these words, in accents choked in tears, O mighty armed Yudhishthira, O thou best of virtuous persons, those men that do not perform ascetic austerities never attain great happiness in this world. People experience happiness and misery by turns, for surely, O bull among men, no man ever enjoyeth unbroken happiness. A wise man endured with high wisdom, knowing that life heart hits ups and downs, is neither filled with joy nor with grief. When happiness cometh, one should enjoy it, when misery cometh, one should bear it, as a sower of crops must bide his season. Nothing is superior to asceticism, by asceticism one acquired mighty fruit. Do thou know, O Bharata, that there is nothing that asceticism cannot achieve. Truth, sincerity, freedom from anger, justice, self-control, restraint of the faculties, immunity from malice, guilelessness, sanctity, and mortification of the senses these, O mighty monarch, purify a person of meritorious acts. Foolish persons addicted to wise and bestial ways, attain to brutish births in afterlife and never enjoy happiness. The fruit of acts done in this world is reaped in the next. Therefore should one restrain his body by asceticism and the observance of woes. And, King, free from guile and with a cheerful spirit one should, according to his power, bestow gifts after going down to the recipient and paying him homage. A truth-telling person attaineth a life devoid of trouble. A person void of anger attaineth sincerity, and one free from malice acquired supreme contentment. A person who heart subdued his senses and his inner faculties, never knoweth tribulation nor is a person of subdued senses affected by sorrow at the height of others' prosperity. A man who giveth everyone his due, and the bestower of boons, attains happiness, and comes by every object of enjoyment, while a man free from envy reapeth perfect ease. He that honoreth those to whom honor is due, attaineth birth in an illustrious line and he that hath subdued his senses, never commit by misfortune. A man whose mind followeth good, after having paid his debt to nature, is on this account born again endued with a righteous mind. Yudhishthira said, O eminently virtuous one, mighty sage, of the bestowal of gifts and the observance of asceticism, which is of greater efficacy in the next world, and which is harder of practice. Vyasa said, There is nothing O child, in this world harder to practice than charity. Men greatly thirst after wealth and wealth also is gotten with difficulty. Nay, renouncing even dear life itself, heroic men, O magnanimous one, enter into the depths of the sea and the forest for the sake of wealth. For wealth, some betake themselves to agriculture and the tending of kin, and some enter into servitude. Therefore it is extremely difficult to part with wealth that is obtained with such trouble. Since nothing is harder to practice than charity therefore, in my opinion even the bestowal of boons is superior to everything. Specially is this to be borne in mind that well-earned gains should in proper time and place, be given away to pious men. But the bestowal of ill-gotten gains can never rescue the giver from the evil of rebirth. It hath been declared, Yudhishthira, that by bestowing in a pure spirit, even a slight gift in due time and to a fit recipient, a man attaineth inexhaustible fruit in the next world. In this connection is instanced the old story regarding the fruit obtained by Madgala, for having given away only a drona of corn. Thus ends the 257th section in the Ghoshayatra Purva of the Varna Purva. 
Section 258, Dhosha Yatra Purva continued. Yudhishthira said, Why did that high souled one give away a drona of corn? An eminently pious one, to whom and in what prescribed way did he give it? Do thou tell me this. Surely, I consider the life of that virtuous person as having borne fruit, with whose practices the possessor himself of the six attributes, witnessing everything was well pleased. Vyasa said, There lived O king, in Kurukshetra a virtuous man, sage Madgala by name. And he was truthful and free from malice, and of subdued senses. And he used to lead the Sila and Ancha modes of life. And although living like a pigeon, yet that one of mighty austerities entertained his guests, celebrated the sacrifice called Istikrita and performed other rites. And that sage together with his son and wife, ate for a fortnight and during the other fortnight led the life of a pigeon collecting a drona of corn, and celebrating the Dasa and Purnamasya sacrifices that one devoid of guile, used to pass his days by taking the food that remained after the deities and the guests had eaten, and on auspicious lunar days that Lord of the Three Worlds, Indra himself, accompanied by the Celestials, O mighty monarch, used to partake of the food offered at his sacrifice. And that one, having adopted the life of a Muni with a cheerful heart, entertained his guests also with food on such days. And as that high-souled one distributed his food with alacrity, the remainder of the drona of corn increased as soon as a guest appeared. And by virtue of the pure spirit in which the sage gave away, that food of his increased so much that hundreds upon hundreds of learned brahmanas were fed with it. And, O king, it came to pass that having heard of the virtuous Madgala observant of woes, the Muni Durvasa, having space alone for his covering, his accoutrements worn like that of a maniac, and his head bare of hair, came there uttering, O Pandava, various insulting words. And having arrived there that best of Munis said unto the Brahmana, Know thou, foremost of Brahmanas, that I have come hither seeking for food. Thereupon Madgala said unto the sage, Thou art welcome. And then offering to that maniac of an ascetic affected by hunger, water to wash his feet and mouth, that one observant of the vow of feeding guests, respectfully placed before him excellent fare. Affected by hunger, the frantic Rishi completely exhausted the food that had been offered unto him. Thereupon, Madgala furnished him again with food. Then having eaten up all that food, he besmeared his body with the unclean oats and went away as he had come. In this manner, during the next season, he came again and ate up all the food supplied by that wise one leading the Ancha mode of life. Thereupon, without partaking any food himself, the sage Madgala again became engaged in collecting corn, following the Ancha mode. Hunger could not disturb his equanimity. Nor could anger nor guile, nor a sense of degradation nor agitation, enter into the heart of that best of Brahmanas leading the Ancha mode of life along with his son and his wife. In this way, Durvasa having made up his mind, during successive seasons presented himself for six several times before that best of sages living according to the Ancha mode, yet that Muni could not perceive any agitation in Madgala's heart, and he found the pure heart of the pure-souled ascetic always pure. Thereupon well pleased, the sage addressed Madgala saying, There is not another guileless and charitable being like thee on earth. The pangs of hunger drive away to a distance the sense of righteousness and deprive people of all patience. The tongue, loving delicacies, attracted men towards them. Life is sustained by food. The mind moreover, is fickle, and it is hard to keep it in subjection. The concentration of the mind and of the senses surely constitutes ascetic austerities. It must be hard to renounce in a pure spirit a thing earned by pains. Yet pious one, all this hath been duly achieved by thee. In thy company we feel obliged and gratified. Self-restraint, fortitude, justice, 
control of the senses and of faculties, mercy, and virtue, all these are established in thee. Thou hast by the deeds, conquered the different worlds and have thereby obtained admission into paths of beatitude. Ah! Even the dwellers of heaven are proclaiming thy mighty deeds of charity. Thou observant of woes, thou shalt go to heaven even in thine own body. Whilst the Muni Durvasa was speaking thus, a celestial messenger appeared before Madgala upon a car yoked with swans and cranes, hung with a neat work of bells, scented with divine fragrance, painted picturesquely and possessed of the power of going everywhere at will. And he addressed the Brahmana sage saying, O sage, do thou ascend into this chariot earned by thy acts. Thou hast attained the fruit of thy asceticism. As the messenger of the gods was speaking thus, the sage told him, O divine messenger, I desire that thou mayst describe unto me the attributes of those that reside there. What are their austerities, and what their purposes? And messenger of the gods, what constitutes happiness in heaven and what are the disadvantages thereof? It is declared by virtuous men of good lineage that friendship with pious people is contracted by only walking with them seven paces. Lord, in the name of that friendship I ask thee, do thou without hesitation tell me the truth, and that which is good for me now. Having heard thee, I shall according to thy words, ascertain the course I ought to follow. Thus ends the 258th section in the Ghoshayatra Purva of the Vana Purva. Section 259, Ghoshayatra Purva continued. The messenger of the gods said, O great sage, thou art of simple understanding, since having secured that celestial bliss which bringeth great honor, thou art still deliberating like an unwise person. Muni, that region which is known as heaven, existed there above us. Those regions tower high and are furnished with excellent paths and are, O sage, always ranged by celestial cars. Atheists and untruthful persons, those that have not practiced ascetic austerities and those that have not performed great sacrifices, cannot repair thither. Only men of virtuous souls, and those of subdued spirits, and those that have their faculties in subjection and those that have controlled their senses and those that are free from malice, and persons intent on the practice of charity, and heroes, and men bearing marks of battle, after having with subdued senses and faculties performed the most meritorious rites, attain those regions, O Brahmana, capable of being obtained only by virtuous acts, and inhabited by pious men. There, O Madgala, are established separately myriads of beautiful, shining, and resplendent worlds bestowing every object of desire, owned by those celestial beings, the gods, the sadhyas, and the Vaiswas, the great sages, Yamas, and the Dharmas, and the Gandharvas and the Apsaras. And there is that monarch of mountains the Golden Meru, extending over a space of 33,000 Yojanas. And there, Madgala, are the sacred gardens of the celestials with Nandana at their head, where sport the persons of meritorious acts. And neither hunger, nor thirst, nor lassitude, nor fear, nor anything that is disgusting or inauspicious is there. And all the odors of that place are delightful, and all the breezes delicious to the touch. And all the sounds there are captivating, O sage, to the ear and the heart. And neither grief, nor decrepitude, nor labor, nor repentance also is there. That world, O Muni, obtained as the fruit of one's own acts, is of this nature. Persons repair thither by virtue of their meritorious deeds. And the persons of those that dwell there look resplendent, and this, Madgala, solely by virtue of their own acts, and not owing to the merits of father or mothers. And there is neither sweat, nor stench, nor urine there. And, there, O Muni, dust doth not soil one's garments. And their excellent garlands, redolent of divine fragrance, never fade. And, Brahmana, 
they yoke such cars as this that I have brought. And, O mighty sage, devoid of envy and grief and fatigue and ignorance and malice, men who have attained heaven, dwell in those regions happily. And, O bull among munis, higher and higher over such regions there are others endued with higher celestial virtues. Of these, the beautiful and resplendent regions of Brahma are the foremost. Thither, O Brahmana, repair rishis that have been sanctified by meritorious acts. And there dwell certain beings named Rebus. They are the gods of the gods themselves. Their regions are supremely blessed, and are adored even by the deities. These shine by their own light, and bestow every object of desire. They suffer no pangs that women might cause, do not possess worldly wealth, and are free from guile. The Rebus do not subsist on oblations, nor yet on ambrosia. And they are endued with such celestial forms that they cannot be perceived by the senses. And these eternal gods of the celestials do not desire happiness for happiness sake, nor do they change at the revolution of a kalpa. Where, indeed, is their decrepitude or dissolution. For them there is neither ecstasy, nor joy, nor happiness. They have neither happiness nor misery. Wherefore should they have anger or aversion then, O Muni? Madgala, their supreme state is coveted even by the gods. And that crowning emancipation, hard to attain, can never be acquired by people subject to desire. The number of those deities is 33. To their regions repair wise men, after having observed excellent woes, or bestowed gifts according to the ordinance. Thou also hast easily acquired that success by thy charities. Do thou, by effulgence displayed by virtue of thy ascetic austerities, enjoy that condition obtained by thy meritorious acts. Such, Brahmana, is the bliss of heaven containing various worlds. Thus have I described unto thee the blessing of the celestial regions. Do thou now hear from me some of the disadvantages thereof. That in the celestial regions a person, while reaping the fruit of the acts he hath already performed, cannot be engaged in any others and that he must enjoy the consequences of the former until they are completely exhausted and further, that he is subject to fall after he hath entirely exhausted his merit, form in my opinion the disadvantages of heaven. The fall of a person whose mind hath been steeped in happiness, must, O Madgala, be pronounced as a fault. And the discontent and regret that must follow one's stay at an inferior seat after one hath enjoyed more auspicious and brighter regions, must be hard to bear. And the consciousness of those about to fall is stupefied and also agitated by emotions. And as the garlands of those about to fall fade away, fear invadeth their hearts. These mighty drawbacks, O Madgala, extend even to the regions of Brahma. In the celestial regions, the virtues of men who have performed righteous acts, are countless. And Muni, this is another of the attributes of the fallen that, by reason of their merits they take birth among men. And then they attain to high fortune and happiness. If one however cannot acquire knowledge here, one commit by an inferior birth. The fruits of acts done in this world are reaped in the next. This world, O Brahmana hath been declared to be one of acts, the others as one of fruit. Thus have I, Madgala, asked by thee described all unto thee. Now, pious one with thy favor, we shall easily set out with speed. Vyasa continued, having heard this speech, Madgala began to reflect in his mind. And having deliberated well, that best of Munis spake thus unto the celestial messenger, O messenger of the gods, I bow unto thee. Do thou sire, depart in peace. I have nothing to do with either happiness or heaven having such prominent defects. Persons who enjoy heaven suffer after all, huge misery and extreme regret in this world. Therefore I do not desire heaven. 
I shall seek for that unfailing region repairing whither people have not to lament or to be pained or agitated. Thou hast described unto me these great defects belonging to the celestial regions. Do thou now describe unto me a region free from faults. Thereupon the celestial messenger said, Above the abode of Brahma there is the supreme seat of Vishnu, pure and eternal and luminous, known by the name of Para Brahma. Thither, Brahmana, cannot repair persons who are attached to the objects of the senses, nor can those subject to arrogance, covetousness, ignorance, anger, and envy, go to that place. It is only those that are free from affection and those free from pride and those free from conflicting emotions and those that have restrained their senses, and those given to contemplation and yoga that can repair thither. Having heard these words, the Muni bade farewell to the celestial messenger, and that virtuous one leading the ancha mode of life, assumed perfect contentment. And then praise and dispraise became equal unto him, and a brick bat, stone, and gold assumed the same aspect in his eyes. And availing himself of the means of attaining Brahma, he became always engaged in meditation. And having obtained power by means of knowledge, and acquired excellent understanding, he attained that supreme state of emancipation which is regarded as eternal. Therefore thou also, Kunti's son, ought not to grieve. Deprived, thou hast truly been of a flourishing kingdom, but thou wilt regain it by thy ascetic austerities. Misery after happiness and happiness after misery revolve by turns round a man, even like the point of a wheel's circumference round the axle. After the thirteenth year hath passed away thou wilt, thou of immeasurable might, get back the kingdom possessed before thee by thy father and grandfather. Therefore, let the fever of thy heart depart. Vesampayana continued, having said this to Panda's son, the worshipful Vyasa went back to his hermitage for the purpose of performing austerities. Thus ends the 259th section in the Ghoshayatra Purva of the Varna Purva. Section 260, Ghoshayatra Purva continued. Janamejaya said, while the high-souled Pandavas were living in those woods, delighted with the pleasant conversation they held with the Munis and engaged in distributing the food they obtained from the sun with various kinds of venison, to Brahmanas and others that came to them for edibles till the hour of Krishna's meal, how, O great Muni, did Duryodhana and the other wicked and sinful sons of Dhritarashtra, guided by the counsels of Dusasana, Karna and Sakuni, deal with them? I ask thee this. Do thou, worshipful sir, enlighten me. Vesampayana said, When, great king, Duryodhana heard that the Pandavas were living as happily in the woods as in a city, he longed with the artful Karna, Dusasana and others, to do them harm. And while those evil-minded persons were employed in concerting various wicked designs, the virtuous and celebrated ascetic Durvasa, following the bent of his own will, arrived at the city of the Gurus with ten thousand disciples. And seeing the irascible ascetic arrived, Duryodhana and his brothers welcomed him with great humility, self-abasement and gentleness. And himself attending on the Rishi as some menial, the prince gave him a right worshipful reception. And the illustrious Muni stayed there for a few days, while King Duryodhana, watchful of his imprecations, attended on him diligently by day and night. And sometimes the Muni would say, I am hungry, King give me some food quickly. And sometimes he would go out for a bath and returning at a late hour, would say, I shall not eat anything today as I have no appetite, and so saying would disappear from his sight. And sometimes, coming all on a sudden, he would say, feed us quickly. And at other times, bent on some mischief, he would awake at midnight and having caused his meals to be prepared as before, would carp at them and not partake of them at all. And trying the prince in this way for a while, when the Muni found that the king Duryodhana was neither angered, nor annoyed, he became graciously inclined towards him. And then, 
O Bharata, the intractable Durvasa said unto him, I have power to grant thee boons. Thou mayst ask of me whatever lies nearest to thy heart. May good fortune be thine. Pleased as I am with thee, thou mayst obtain from me anything that is not opposed to religion and morals. Vesampayana continued, hearing these words of the great ascetic, Suyodhana felt himself to be inspired with new life. Indeed it had been agreed upon between himself and Karna and Dusasana as to what the boon should be that he would ask of the Muni, if the latter were pleased with his reception. And the evil-minded king, bethinking himself of what had previously been decided, joyfully solicited the following favor, saying, The great king Yudhishthira is the eldest and the best of our race. That pious man is now living in the forest with his brothers. Do thou therefore once become the guest of that illustrious one even as, O Brahmana, thou hast with thy disciples been mine for some time. If thou art minded to do me a favor, do thou go unto him at a time when that delicate and excellent lady, the celebrated princess of Panchala, after having regaled with food the Brahmanas, her husbands and herself, may lie down to rest. The Rishi replied, even so shall I act for thy satisfaction. And having said this to Suyodhana, that great Brahmana Durvasa, went away in the very same state in which he had come. And Suyodhana regarded himself to have attained all the objects of his desire. And holding Karna by the hand he expressed great satisfaction. And Karna too, joyfully addressed the king in the company of his brothers saying, by a piece of singular good luck, thou hast fared well and attained the objects of thy desire. And by good luck it is that thy enemies have been immersed in a sea of dangers that is difficult to cross. The sons of Pandu are now exposed to the fire of Durvasa's wrath. Through their own fault they have fallen into an abyss of darkness. Vesampayana continued, O king, expressing their satisfaction in this strain, Duryodhana and others bent on evil machinations, returned merrily to their respective homes. Thus ends the 268th section in the Ghoshayatra Purva of the Vana Purva. Section 261, Draupadi Harana Purva. Vesampayana said, One day, having previously ascertained that the Pandavas were all seated at their ease and that Krishna was reposing herself after her meal, the sage Durvasa, surrounded by 10,000 disciples repaired to that forest. The illustrious and upright King Yudhishthira, seeing that guest arrived, advanced with his brothers to receive him. And joining the palms of his hands and pointing to a proper and excellent seat, he accorded the Rishi a fit and respectful welcome. And the king said unto him, Return quick, adorable sir, after performing thy diurnal ablutions and observances. And that sinless Muni, not knowing how the king would be able to provide a feast for him and his disciples, proceeded with the latter to perform his ablutions. And that host of the Muni, of subdued passions, went into the stream for performing their ablutions. Meanwhile, O king, the excellent princess Draupadi, devoted to her husbands, was in great anxiety about the food to be provided for the Munis. And when after much anxious thought she came to the conclusion that means there were none for providing a feast, she inwardly prayed to Krishna, the slayer of Kansa. And the princess said, Krishna, Krishna, of mighty arms, son of Devki, whose power is inexhaustible, O Vasudeva, O Lord of the universe, who dispellest the difficulties of those that bow down to thee, thou art the soul the creator and the destroyer of the universe. Thou Lord, art inexhaustible and the savior of the afflicted. Thou art the preserver of the universe and of all created beings. Thou art the highest of the high, and the spring of the mental perception Sakuli and Chiti. O supreme and infinite being, giver of all good, be thou the refuge of the helpless. O primordial being, Incapable of being conceived by the soul or the mental faculties or otherwise, thou art the ruler of all and the lord of Brahma. 
I seek thy protection, God, thou art ever kindly disposed towards those that take refuge in thee. Do thou cherish me with thy kindness. O thou with a complexion dark as the leaves of the blue lotus, and with eyes red as the corolla of the lily, and attired in yellow robes, with besides the bright Kaustubha gem in thy bosom, thou art the beginning and the end of creation, and the great refuge of all. Thou art the supreme light and essence of the universe. Thy face is directed towards every point. They call thee supreme germ and the depository of all treasures. Under thy protections, Lord of the Gods, all evils lose their terror. As thou didst protect me before from Dusasana, do thou extricate me now from this difficulty. Vesampayana continued, the great and sovereign God, and Lord of the earth, of mysterious movements, the Lord Kesava who is ever kind to the dependents, thou adored by Krishna, and perceiving her difficulty, instantly repaired to that place leaving the bed of Rukmani who was sleeping by his side. Beholding Vasudeva, Draupadi bowed down to him in great joy and informed him of the arrival of the Munis and every other thing. And having heard everything Krishna said unto her, I am very much afflicted with hunger, do thou give me some food without delay, and then thou mayst go about thy work. At these words of Kesava, Krishna became confused, and replied unto him, saying, The sun given vessel remains full till I finish my meal. But as I have already taken my meal today, there is no food in it now. Then that lotus-eyed and adorable being said unto Krishna, This is no time for jest Krishna, I am much distressed with hunger, go thou quickly to fetch the vessel and show it to me. When Kesava, that ornament of the Yadu's race had the vessel brought unto him with such persistence, he looked into it and saw a particle of rice and vegetables sticking at its rim. And swallowing it he said unto her, May it please the god Hari, the soul of the universe, and may that god who partake that sacrifices, be satiated with this. Then the long-armed Krishna, that soother of miseries, said unto Bhimasena, Do thou speedily invite the Munis to dinner. Then, good king, the celebrated Bhimasena quickly went to invite all those Munis, Durvasa and others who had gone to the nearest stream of transparent and cool water to perform their ablutions. Meanwhile, these ascetics, having plunged into the river, were rubbing their bodies and observing that they all felt their stomachs to be full. And coming out of the stream, they began to stare at one another. And turning towards Durvasa, all those ascetics observed, having bade the king make our meals ready, we have come hither for a bath. But how, O regenerate Rishi, can we eat anything now for our stomachs seem to be full to the throat? The repast hath been uselessly prepared for us. What is the best thing to be done now? Durvasa replied, By spoiling the repast, we have done a great wrong to that royal sage, King Yudhishthira. Would not the Pandavas destroy us by looking down upon us with angry eyes? I know the royal sage Yudhishthira to be possessed of great ascetic power. Ye Brahmanas, I am afraid of men that are devoted to Hari. The high-souled Pandavas are all religious men, learned, warlike, diligent in ascetic austerities and religious observances, devoted to Vasudeva, and always observant of rules of good conduct. If provoked, they can consume us with their rot as fire dot a bale of cotton. Therefore ye disciples, do ye all run away quickly without seeing them again? Vesampayana continued, all those Brahmanas, thus advised by their ascetic preceptor, became greatly afraid of the Pandavas, and fled away in all directions. Then Bhimasena, not beholding those excellent Munis in the celestial river, made a search after them here and there at all the landing places and learning from the ascetics of those places that they had run away, he came back and informed Yudhishthira of what had happened. Then all the Pandavas of subdued senses, expecting them to come, remained awaiting their arrival for some time. And Yudhishthira said,
coming dead of night, the Rishis will deceive us. Oh how can we escape from this difficulty created by the facts? Seeing them absorbed in such reflections and breathing long deep sighs at frequent intervals, the illustrious Krishna suddenly appeared to them and addressed them these words, knowing, Ye sons of Pritha, your danger from that wrathful Rishi, I was implored by Dhrampadi to come, and therefore have I come here speedily. But now ye have not the least fear from the Rishi Durvasa. Afraid of your ascetic powers, he hath made himself scarce array this. Virtuous men never suffer. I now ask your permission to let me return home. May you always be prosperous. Vesampayana continued, hearing Kesava's words, the sons of Pritha, with Dhrampadi, became easy in mind. And cured of their fever of anxiety, they said unto him, as persons drowning in the wide ocean safely reach the shore by means of a boat, so have we by thy aid, Lord Govinda, escaped from this inextricable difficulty. Do thou now depart in peace, and may prosperity be thine. Thus dismissed, he repaired to his capital and the Pandavas too, blessed Lord, wandering from forest to forest passed their days merrily with Dhrampadi. Thus, King, have I related to thee the story which thou askedest me to repeat. And it was thus that the machinations of the wicked sons of Dhritarashtra about the Pandavas in the forest, were frustrated. Thus ends the 261st section in the Dhrampadi Harana Purva of the Vana Purva. If you enjoyed this audiobook, please like and subscribe to be notified of when new audiobooks are uploaded. Thank you for listening and learning. Shanti.